Great, good seeing folks here. Today's scripture is taken from 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 1 through 11, and it reads like this. If any of you has a dispute with another, do you dare to take it before the ungodly for judgment instead of before the Lord's people? Or do you not know that the Lord's people will judge the world? And if you are to judge the world, are you not competent to judge trivial cases? Do you not know that we will judge angels? How much more the things of this life? Therefore, if you have disputes about such matters, do you ask for ruling from those whose way of life is scorned in the church? I say this to shame you. Is it possible that there is no one among you wise enough to judge a dispute between believers? But instead, one brother takes another to court, and this in front of unbelievers. The very fact that you have lawsuits among you means you have been completely defeated already. Why not rather be wronged? Why not rather be cheated? Instead, you yourselves cheat and doing wrong, and you do this to your brothers and sisters. Or do you not know that wrongdoers will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, or adulterers, nor men who have sex with men, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor slanderers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. And this is what some of you were. But you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of God. May the Lord add his blessing to the reading of his word this morning. So we've been down this path, right? Uh, we're now in 1 Corinthians chapter 6. We started in the new year with Paul's conversion from Saul to Paul um, as he was on the road to Damascus and he had an encounter with the living and resurrected Jesus Christ. His life was changed from uh, a Christian hater to then um, creating Christians and evangelizing people to come to Christ. He went from being a church destroyer to a church planter. He went from being a person that just hated to being a person who loves. And so um, we've been, from there we went into the, the book of Corinthians, 1 Corinthians. Uh, one, of the, one of the first churches that was established by Paul in, uh, in Corinth, which was a Roman providence, but at the same time, it was of Greek uh, culture. And um, <clears throat> the Greek and, and Roman culture of the day was very sexually charged and um, very corrupt. And so we saw where, where, where in, in the first Corinthians, uh, Paul has to establish his conversation with these Christians in a way of reminding them that the wisdom of God is so much more higher than the wisdom of man. That there are issues and problems that he's going to attack, that he's going to handle, but he's going to do it through scriptural knowledge, through spiritual knowledge, which comes from the wisdom of God. And then from there, he, he, he goes on to say that as Christians, we have been given the mind of Christ. The Holy Spirit gives us the mind of Christ. But the issue is that many of us with the mind of Christ, as with the Corinthians, we have not allowed the Holy Spirit to develop it in us yet. And so um, in chapter three, he kind of calls them babies, right? He says, I can't give you meat. You have to still survive on milk because you haven't matured. You have not allowed the mind of Christ to grow in you and to become mature Christians who could handle the real matters. But you know what? Paul's just preparing them because he's going to bring up some heavy stuff after this. You see, he has to handle these issues that are going on. There's extreme division going on in the church. There are factions growing on the church. Some say we, we, we follow this preacher and we follow that pastor and we follow that leader. 
But it wasn't just that they had their preferences, it's that then they began to uh, alienate and put down the ones that didn't think like them. You know people like that? If you don't think the way I think, I don't want to have anything to do with you. Well, that's what, what was happening in the culture of the church of Corinth. And so Paul's like, listen, you're not of, of Apollos, and you're not of Paul, and you're not of Cephas, which is Peter. You belong to Christ. Christ is the head of the church. And we are all servants of God. And so um, then we went through uh, chapter 4 and 5. And now we're in chapter 6. 5 dealt with the idea of a man who was sleeping with his stepmother. And Paul had to straighten that out. As a matter of fact, Paul uses some very strong verbiage here. He says to hand them over to Satan for the destruction of the flesh with hopes that his soul at the end would be saved. And I explain what that means, right? That the idea is that, that, that what we do with people who constantly insist on living a negative life toward God, eventually we have to surrender them away and they're out of the cover, out of underneath the umbrella of God's protection. And so they are open to the attack of their flesh, the destruction of their flesh, in hopes that their spirit then would wake up and turn back to God before their life is over. And today we're in chapter 6. We're, we're going to go verse by verse. I'm going to give you the explanation. If you have your Bible, open it up to 1 Corinthians chapter 6. I'll tell you what verses I'm talking about. And, and you read those verses and then see what I'm talking about and explaining, okay? So the first one we're starting with is verses 1 and 2. So it comes to the point where Paul's... Is, is it's brought to Paul's attention that there are two in the church that are in litigation against each other. There are, they're suing each other. And, um, and it's because of a minor dispute, according to those that have examined this. It's not a major dispute. It's a minor dispute. How many of you ever heard the analogy of a snowball rolling down a mountain, by the time you get to the bottom, it's, right, humongous. It's built up momentum, and, and it's built up on itself. And so this is what's happening here. This was a small matter, and, and because of bickering and the lack of being able to, to uh, humble themselves, it becomes a matter that's, that's blown out of proportion, and now they go to the courts to the secular courts to handle this. Now, what Paul's objection to this was that Paul knew full well what the Roman courts were like. He says in that chapter, right, that um, they are unrighteous. So to bring a matter of the church before an unrighteous judge the Roman system was so corrupt that no matter what you did, you could buy your way out of almost anything. If you had the money and if you had the influence, does that sound familiar? If you had the influence, you could, you could buy your way out of anything. You know, that the, the, the typical jury back then in the Roman court we, we have how many in a typical jury? Come on, I know everybody knows this, right? How many? Twelve, right? The typical Roman jury could go up to 40 people. Could you imagine trying to get a decision by 40 people to think the same way? So there was a lot of uh, uh, conniving and, and, and bribing and, and you know, twisting people's arms to then get your way in court. And so Paul's like, listen, your brothers and sisters in Christ 
you have a disagreement, isn't it better that you maybe get cheated? Maybe let it go? Hey, I got an idea. Didn't somebody one time say, if somebody hits you in the cheek, turn the other cheek? So Paul's reminding them that, 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 that taking a matter that should be handled in the house and exposing it to the world who is unjust and corrupt to then bring justice into this matter. And Paul's like, you're looking in the wrong place. Don't you have elders in your church? Don't you have people with experience in life that could sit down and guide you through this? Instead of shaming the name of Jesus by bringing this matter and involving the unjust or the unrighteous. Paul knew how corrupt the Roman system was. He stood before Roman judges many times in his life. Plus, he was a Roman citizen himself. So Paul is reminding them, listen, you, you, guys, you guys have the equipment. And you've, you've been equipped and you have the authority. And then he, he, he throws this little tidbit in there. Don't you know that you're going to judge the world? The Lord's people will judge the world. He goes on to this in, um, in verse 3 and 8. He talks about this. Now, what, what exactly does that mean? And he even says, judge the world and angels. So what are we going to like stand in heaven and tell our guardian angel, hey, where were you that day I had the accident? No, that's, that's, that's not what he's talking about. I know some guys that their guardian angel's wings are like scorched and burned because they put them through a lot, right? But that's not what it's talking about. It's talking about the fallen angels, what we call demons. And this is why we are attacked. This is why humans are so attacked by evil forces, because we remind the enemy and his cohorts of what is to come as Christians. We are to judge not just the world, but angels, the fallen angels. This is what Jesus says. He says that um, it tells us that um, Jesus is going to keep his word to the end will be, that will be given a share in authority over the nations and over all these things. So Jesus will share his glory or his authority with those that are faithful to the end. How long do we have to be faithful? Amen. How long? Amen. To the end, right? So before going to an unrighteous judge, I mean, we will judge the world. We do, we do that daily, we judge the world. Listen, when you get up and you get yourself ready for church in the morning and you don't know it, but your neighbor's looking through the shades, there they go again. Those fanatics. You're judging. You're bringing uh, uh, judgment to the world. They feel judged because they don't know what you have in Christ. They can't relate to you, and they feel judged. Now, remember, I spoke about that, right? That the, the idea of judge, the, uh, many people, they, they don't know the scriptures, but they know this one verse. How many of you know what that verse is? <laughs> judge not, right? The Bible says don't judge. It's the only one they know. It's the only defense they have, right? But then also, Jesus told that if you have uh, if your brother has, a, or, or if you have, or your brother has a speck in his eye, he says, "Take the beam out of your own eye first, right?" But then he says, "So then you can help your brother take the speck out of the, his eye." So the idea is that if we're in the same boat as you are, we can't judge. But if God has done a work in us, then we're in a place where we could say, "Listen, what you're doing is going to bring destruction to your life," which is what the world calls judging. Right. When we try to talk common sense. 
Okay, verses 9 and 10. Paul reminds the Corinthians that they're not like those outside of the church. Right? uh, Those outside of the church have this wicked standard. They have this corrupt standard. And and so Paul not just goes from um, um, dealing with, with brothers and sisters taking each other to court over minor things. And let me get this... Let me straighten this out. Um, the Bible in no way is saying don't take things to court or to the authorities or to the government. According to Romans, God has established the governments to take care of the corruption and the sin which creates problems in us, in our society. It's established. Um, there's no way that we're going to let uh, um, molestation or abuse, or stealing, or anything like that, go away because, oh, well, you know, we don't take each other to court. No, that's a misinterpretation of this chapter. This is talking about two Christians in the same church that that are suing each other over what parking they want to use. You understand the difference? How stupid and how ignorant that is to take that to court that I'm going to sue you as a Christian in this church because I don't like the color of the rugs you picked. There has to be a better way of dealing with that kind of minor stuff. But when it comes to the major stuff, there's, there's, there's nothing in the Bible that says that we're not supposed to take this before the courts when it comes to abuse and, and, um, and those kind of crimes, those type of crimes rather. And so from there, he goes on to, to um, deal with, uh, in verses 9 to 11, he, he goes on to say that, 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 you know, you guys are arguing and fighting, but you forget who you are. He says, this is what you used to be. And he goes down the list of what they used to be. He, they have these labels. He wants them to know that at one time they were uh, uh, corrupt. They were uh, um, labeled with the sins that they participated in. But then he reminds them that they've been clean. They've been washed. They've been justified. By the blood of Christ. But it seems as if somehow these things that Paul is telling them that they need to deal with are trying to worm their way back into the church, into the congregation. And Paul is urging them to live up to their name in Christ and not down to the standards of this world. Okay, in verses, in verse 20, I'm going to go to verse 20, but then eventually I'm going to jump back to, to, to 19 um, and, and uh, 12 and 19 because there's some explanation that has to go back and forth here. So at this point, Paul wants to correct some wrong thinking with the Corinthians. They have these issues, they have these problems, they have these uh, uh, um, sexual appetites. That's more than just the guy that was sleeping with his, uh, with, with his stepmother. It has to do with uh, um, going to temple, what they call temple prostitutes at that time. The, the pagan temples supported their, their, their religion through prostitution. And so uh, Paul's like reminding them, you can't participate with this. And so the, uh, he, there's a free-for-all going on because that was the culture. It's not much different than today's culture. That was the culture. It was this free-for-all for for sin. And so um, the people of of Corinth had this wrong thinking when it came to these things and the way they should act in the church. And and Paul wants to then now, uh, uh, he wants to address this stinking thinking that the Christians has. What what were they saying? What were they saying? Well, first they were saying that um, nothing is sinful for the Christian because we're free in Christ and we're no longer under the law. 
How many of you ever hear somebody say that? Well, we're not under the law. I don't have to do that. The second thing they were saying was that sexual uh, 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 desires are just like your appetite. If you're hungry, you go make a sandwich, right? So that's what they were saying. And thirdly, they were saying that, you know, we're spirits. At the end of the day, we're spirits. You know, we're soul, body, mind, and spirit, and, and we're spirit. And so what we do to our bodies, what we do with our bodies is not important because we're spirits. And so Paul now wants to address this stinking thinking of the Corinthians. So he addresses, first of all, that the standard for the believer should not be if something is in the law, you know, those are loopholes, right? Well, the Bible really, the Bible doesn't say I can't do this. You know, I've had people all the time, Pastor Joe, does the Bible say that we could do this? Or does it say that we could? And I'm like, you're looking for loopholes. The, Paul reminds them that the important thing isn't whether or not something is lawful or not. But is it beneficial? Is it something that's going to get you closer with your relationship to Christ? Or is it something that's going to pull you away from your relationship with Christ? So that's how Paul handles that first idea that, well, you know, we're not under the law anymore. It's a, he's, he's trying to let them know that it's even, it's, the obligation of the Christian is even beyond the law. It's a conscious thing of whether or not this is going to uh, be beneficial in my Christian life. And the second way he handles the, the second issue, that, that um, sex is just another appetite to quench whenever we want to with whoever we want to. I, I don't know if you remember back in the, I don't know if it was the 60s or 70s, there was a song that used to say, if you can't be with the one you love, honey. Love oh, you guys know that song really good, don't you? <laughs> right? Love the one. What a message, right? You bump into somebody in a bar and boom, you're in bed with them. Love the one you're with. That's not love, right? We've, we've twisted that word into, into meaning something it's not. But how does Paul handle this? He tells them, first of all, that sex is more than just another appetite. Sex is created by God. It's beautiful. God said everything he created was good. But when we take what God creates that is good and we twist it into fit our fashion and our modes of doing it, it becomes perverse. And so Paul tells them that, 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 um, that these sexual desires, that the, 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 the idea of just going with anyone you want is dangerous because the Bible tells us, he goes back to Genesis. He says, and the two will become one. Genesis chapter 2, verse 24. The two become one. And when we involve ourselves physically with another, we are becoming spiritually and physically one with that person. And so Paul's reminding them of this, that this is more important than just the idea of, of, of uh, um, you know, quenching an appetite. That there is a spiritual ramification to this act, that this is something that God has created, but it is to be practiced under the bonds of holy matrimony. And so the, the third answer to this, to uh, the, the, the stinking thinking of the Corinthians that, that believed that, um, that everything was, uh, wait, that what we do with our mortal bodies doesn't matter because we're, we're, we're spiritual, we're souls, we're spiritual souls, so it doesn't matter. So he, he goes, we're going to um, verses 12 through 19. We see what a Christian does with his or her body matters. First of all, 
sexual integrity for the Christian, right? I'm talking to the church. This isn't a judgment of the world that wants to live the way it wants. They will do that until, until either they have a revelation who God is or until they die and go to judgment. But for us in the church, we have to realize that sexual integrity is the way the Christian tells Jesus, I love you and respect you. By keeping ourselves pure. And Paul reminds them that, listen, what you do with your body is important. I know you're spiritual beings, but listen, you are going to be resurrected. The way Jesus rose from the dead, you will be resurrected. So it matters what you do with your body. And he even goes to the point of being joint with a prostitute. That when you join yourself, when you, as a Christian, when you sit down to look at that pornography, or when you get involved with somebody sexually that you're not connected to in marriage, well, as a Christian now, what you're doing is saying, Jesus, come with me and look at what I'm going to do. How many of you really believe that Jesus wants to be in that atmosphere and in that situation? We have to think about that. We say Jesus lives in our hearts. So now he's present with you in all that you do. So, Paul's not finished with the church of Corinth. He's still cleaning house. And, but I, I hope these studies are helping you in some way. I hope you're getting something out of it. Um, I hope it's helping your relationship with Christ. And that's the most important thing. Okay, so um, I'm going to have a word of prayer.